the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In today's Gospel reading, we hear the story of Jesus cleansing the temple and teaching that he himself will one day be the real temple. He is the temple. In our worship over the last few months, we have been ourselves banished from the temple in which normally we meet. But we hold in mind that Jesus himself is the temple, that he said that those who truly worship must worship in spirit and in truth. It's in our hearts that we enter the temple that he is. And so, as we worship together, we make our prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus chapter 20 at the first verse. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and obey my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor 
and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honour your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord is given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. 
The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. They then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I preach in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Did the cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem happen at the beginning or at the end of Jesus' public ministry? It's a question that has been debated by biblical scholars for centuries. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this startling event as taking place in the days leading up to the Passover festival in the final week of Jesus' life, whereas John's Gospel records it as happening two or three years earlier, placing it straight after the miracle at Cana in Galilee, when Jesus turned into wine the water that was to be used by the wedding guests for their ritual washing. While there is plenty of room for legitimate debate, I believe that John deliberately placed the account of this event where he did because he saw, it, saw in it a sign, a particular meaning that he wished to draw out from it. Throughout his Gospel, John is far more concerned with themes than with strict chronology. And in this case, by recounting Jesus' cleansing of the temple straight after the miracle at Cana, which was the first of Jesus' signs, surely John wants us to make a connection between the cleansing of individual people and the cleansing of the temple as a religious institution. John juxtaposes the personal cleansings at the wedding feast with an institutional cleansing of the temple, a purifying of religion, in order to warn us that God will judge both individuals and institutions. John is also reminding us that, just like our personal faith, institutional religion can easily become stagnant. Church history recounts many periods when Christianity lost its vision, its inspiration and its impetus. It's a particular danger that faces those of us who worship in magnificent buildings like this ancient and beautiful cathedral, which has stood here for centuries. On the one hand, we value the stability and the permanence that it represents which assures us of the reliability of God. <clears throat> but on the other hand, it can too easily convey a static idea of God, which can become a positive hindrance to our proclamation of the gospel. When the Israelites were in the desert fleeing from slavery in Egypt, their symbol of the presence of God was a tent which could be packed up and moved easily. The Christian Church is first and foremost a movement, but it has also to take an institutional form which inevitably slows down the forward momentum of the movement to go out and to share the good news of Jesus. There's also another danger facing us, that the Church may become not only static but also stale. In turning the water into wine and in driving out the temple traders into the street, Jesus was showing us that he intends to make all things new and that he has the power to revive and refresh both people and institutions. But I'm galloping ahead. We need first to consider what it was that so aroused the anger of Jesus and prompted him to make a whip of cords 
and to drive out the traders and money changers from the temple. Was it simply that Jesus objected to business being conducted within the temple precincts? Well, that seems unlikely because, at least in principle, there was nothing in the law to rule out business transactions taking place within the temple precincts. Just as we consider it acceptable to hold a Christmas fair in the nave of the cathedral, so the people of Israel would have been comfortable with the idea of purchases being made in the temple precincts. After all, the trade being conducted there served a useful religious purpose. Because in making the journey up to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, many pilgrims would have travelled a considerable distance. It would have been both inconvenient and difficult for them to bring from their home villages the animals that they intended to offer for sacrifice in the temple during the festival. Even carrying something small like pigeons would have been a nuisance. So it was really helpful having traders in the temple precincts selling what the pilgrims needed for sacrifice. That was fine. But what annoyed Jesus was almost certainly that the traders had turned their monopoly into a racket to rip off the pilgrims, many of whom were desperately poor. Although John's Gospel does not use the word, the other three Gospel writers all record Jesus condemning the traders for being robbers. It would have been fine for them to sell their wares at a reasonable and affordable price, but Jesus made it clear that to rip off their customers was theft, pure and simple. And what about the money changers? Why was Jesus furious with them? How might they have been robbing the pilgrims? Well, simply because the pilgrims would have arrived in Jerusalem with ordinary currency in their pockets or purses, coins which bore the image of the emperor in Rome. That ordinary currency was unacceptable in the temple. To use it to make an offering would have been an insult to the God of Israel. So ordinary currency had to be exchanged for temple currency, and it was the money changers who fixed the rate of exchange, which gave them plenty of scope for exploitation, especially of the poor, who would have been inexperienced in such financial matters. So it seems fairly safe for us to conclude that the anger of Jesus against the traders and the money changers was directed at their dishonesty and their unjust exploitation of faithful pilgrims, certainly, but also because, perhaps because the traders and the money changers were using for their own benefit what properly belonged to the service of God. Sacrificial animals were needed and money needed to be changed to enable the worship of God. There was nothing wrong with that. But then the provision of those facilities was being corrupted by greed and personal ambition. It's little wonder then that Jesus became so angry in the temple precincts. And we are inclined to applaud his impulsive actions and to do so with a feeling of comfortable self-righteousness. After all, we wouldn't dream of exploiting people like the traders and the money changers did, would we? But surely this is where we should exercise some caution and examine carefully our consciences by asking ourselves, what was the basic sin of the traders and the money changers? Well, surely it was the fact that they were using their provision of essential religious services for selfish ends. It's a danger that faces all of us who exercise any kind of ministry in the church. We have always to question our motivation for doing what we do, whether we officiate, preach the word, 
read the scriptures, offer the intercessions, serve at the altar, or lead a prayer group. Whatever our particular ministry might be, we should question why we are doing it. Is it because we secretly desire to enhance our reputation, or to seek approval, or to be acclaimed, and to feel good about ourselves? There is, of course, a very proper sense of satisfaction and fulfilment that we experience when we have humbly served God as best we can, and we can rightly take comfort in it. But our focus should always remain fixed on giving God the glory and on using our gifts in ways that are a blessing to God's people. In that way, the Holy Spirit can continue our Lord's daily work of cleansing us as individuals, as well as cleansing our churches of all that is unworthy in his sight. To God be the glory, today and always. in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ. Let us pray to the Father. Blessed are those who are undefiled in the way and walk in the law of the Lord. Father, preserve the integrity of your church so that we remain secure from worldliness and seeking after gain. We pray for the Christians of the Anglican Communion, for Justin in his role as head of that communion 
as well as head of the Church of England. And today for our brothers and sisters in the Anglican Church of the Congo, for the primate and the Bishop of Kinshasa, Massimango. Within our own diocese, we remember Richard, our bishop. The parishes of the Hereford Deanery, praying especially for Ruth Hulse, the rural dean, for Jackie Mumford, the lay co-chairman, Rosemary Lording, the treasurer, and Malcolm Robertson, the subwarden of readers. Give grace and wisdom to all your clergy and people that they may preach the gospel and live their lives according to your ways and your laws. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. The commandment of the Lord is pure and giveth light unto the eyes. Father, in a world of turmoil and poverty, ignorance and prejudice, enlighten all our leaders that they may carry a true sense of vocation to serve their people. Give them wisdom and vision that they may seek the way of goodness, uncorrupted by the love of power and gain. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we ask your blessing on the farming community who work the land producing food for all people. All who care for the natural world and those who use and sometimes abuse it. Give us respect for your whole creation that we may work to preserve habitats and ecosystems for the generations yet to come. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, bless our families, especially those from whom we are parted at this time. Strengthen those in our communities who have responsibility for teaching our children, nurturing our young people, and alleviating poverty and homelessness. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, comfort and relieve the victims of lust, slavery, dishonesty and violence and restore them to the freedom found in Christ alone. We lay at your feet, Father, all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. And in a time of silence, we name to you, Father, those for whom we are concerned. Put your healing hands upon them and restore them to wholeness of life. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we commit to you all those who have died in the peace of Christ looking forward to the fulfillment of your promise of eternal life. We pray too for those who died frightened 
and alone. Gather them all into your kingdom where you reign supreme over all things. Among those whose anniversaries of death fall this week, we remember Dennis Evans, Jenny Williams, Margaret Masters, Eileen Sprayson, Valerie Waters, Derek Jenkins, Peter Hogg, Colin Riches, David Emlyn Williams, and Gordon Chambers. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Father, we pray that we may be your body on earth single-minded and united in our willingness to do your will and to walk in righteousness so that your kingdom may be proclaimed in all the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Be with us, Lord, in all our prayers, and direct our way toward the attainment of salvation, that among the changes and chances of this mortal life we may always be defended by your gracious help, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us unite these and all our prayers in the words our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.